some of you know, perhaps many of you know, uh, my wife's family has a restaurant. Her, it was started by her grandfather. Uh, now her uncle is the owner of it. And it's Sonny's famous steak hoagies down in Hollywood. And just, you know, completely unbiased, it is the best steak hoagie I have ever had in my life. In fact, once you have a steak hoagie from Sonny's, it essentially spoils all other steak hoagies. Just, just being honest, be, because we recognize I can't go anywhere else and have a steak hoagie and be happy. Because the comparison is too high. And the garlic rolls, but we won't get into that because that'll, that'll make us all way too hungry for this morning. But here, here's what we realize. I cannot find a better steak hoagie. There's no other place that we go to get steak hoagies other than Sonny's because none can compare. None can challenge the steak hoagie that is there at Sonny's. Once you've had one, it spoils all other attempts at a steak hoagie. We're in Exodus this morning. Continuing our journey through this, this well-known story, this epic saga of the Old Testament. Remember, Exodus is essentially chapter 2 after Genesis being chapter 1 of the story. Keying in on the life of Moses, the one raised up by God to bring deliverance. What's fascinating to see, one commentator wrote, Exodus is essentially God going public. If you read Genesis, God is at work in the lives of individuals and families and is at work in smaller ways. But here in the Exodus, what we see is God making a grand public declaration that he is God and there is no one else. And we're going to see that front and center today as we work through one of the more well-known sections of the Old Testament. After nearly 400 years in bondage, The people crying out to God for deliverance. God raises up Moses. Remember, Moses was schooled in the palace of Pharaoh. He was given all the wisdom of the Egyptians and knew the plight of his people and sought to be a deliverer. But on his own, he could not deliver because his own attempts left him murdering one Egyptian, burying him in the sand, realizing that he had been found out and running for his life. He spent 40 years in Midian as a shepherd. And God showed up to him, spoke to him through the burning bush, and declared, God declared to Moses that he was sending him back. Go back to Egypt. Last week we saw that when Moses and Aaron ended up back in Egypt before Pharaoh, the opposition was firm. But God was at work even in this, promising to display his great wonders to the world. As he pulls his people out of Egypt with his mighty outstretched arm. Today the main point I want you to see is the fact that God is God. God is God. And we are looking at nine of the ten plagues. Some of you are getting nervous right now. Just hang on with me. It's going gonna, it's gonna to work. God is God. If you have a Bible, look with me as we work through the story here together. Because of the length of the narrative, I'm going to be reading portions and then summarizing other portions as we work through. And we'll begin to see a pattern develop as we read through these nine plagues. Again, the ten plagues are fairly well known in the course of Bible history. If you went to Sunday school as a kid at all, you heard stories about the plagues. Many of you could probably quote them at least close to in order. Here, as we look to the Word of God. Chapter 7, verse 14 through 19. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning. As he is going out to the water, stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand the staff That turned into a serpent. And you shall say to him. The Lord the God of the Hebrews. Sent me to you saying. Let my people go. That they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. 
Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, the staff that is in my hand, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn into blood. The fish in the Nile shall die. The Nile will stink, and the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water. From the Nile. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff, stretch it out, stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the rivers, over the canals, over their ponds, all their pools of water, so that it may become blood, and there shall be blood throughout the land of Egypt, even in the vessels of wood and the vessels of stone. This is the word of the Lord. The first plague comes and hits quite triumphantly for the people of God as Moses goes down and in essentially a square off challenge says to Pharaoh, here it comes. You have not obeyed the voice of the Lord. So everything, all the water will be turned to blood. Moses and Aaron did exactly as was warned, as was said for them to do. And the entirety of the of the Nile was turned to blood. All of the all of the ponds, all of the wells, all of the canals, all of their irrigation systems, the canals that they had dug, even the pots they had. All the water in Egypt turned to blood. The fish of the Nile died and the stench was thick. The people, in order to survive, had to dig For themselves new wells. Find groundwater to drink. Because we see that this lasted for a total of seven days. But the magicians of Egypt were able to repeat or at least mimic this plague. As though they needed to turn more water into blood. Um, They were able to repeat this through their magic arts. And Pharaoh's heart remained hardened. After the water was turned to blood. The second plague we see in Exodus chapter 8. Read with me verse 1 through 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague your country with frogs. The Nile shall swarm with frogs. That shall shall come up into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed and into your houses the houses of your servants and your people and into your ovens and your kneading bowls. The frogs shall come up on you and on your people and on all your servants. You see, outside of the little boys in Egypt, this was a major problem for everybody else. I'm sure the little boys were thought this was the coolest thing ever because they didn't have to go catch the frogs. The frogs were catching them. But again, the magicians were able to replicate this plague. They were able to bring more frogs up out of the water. Again, thinking logically, did they think they were helping? Pharaoh had had enough of this, though. No longer was this just a little annoyance. Pharaoh called Moses and said, listen, if you will make the frogs go away, I'll let the people go and worship. So Moses said, tell me what time you want them to go away. So that you will know that God is God. And so they settled on the next morning. So Moses, the next morning, pleaded with God, and the frogs died out. They threw them into heaps, and again the land stank. But Pharaoh, upon seeing the reprieve from the frogs, again hardened his heart toward the Hebrews, just like God had said. The third plague comes In chapter 8, verse 16, Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth so that it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. Swarms of gnats. Older translations actually translate this as lice. And we don't know the Hebrew word exactly, whether it's gnats or lice. lice. Essentially, it's small little biting critters. You can't really see them, but you know when they're on you. Less is written of the third plague than most of the others. And we'll get to the the organization, organization and structure of the plagues here in just a minute. But we see that less is written here. But what is brought to the forefront down just a few verses from this is the fact that the magicians could not replicate this plague. After two, they were out. They could no longer compete. 
They could no longer, through their magic arts, mimic the plague. But again, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to the Lord. The fourth plague, we see we graduate from gnats to flies. Look at chapter 8, verses 20 through 24. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning, present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out to, to the water, and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me, or else, if you will not, let my people go. Behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. But on the, that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell so that no swarms of flies shall be there that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus, I will put division between my people and your people. Tomorrow, this sign shall happen. And the Lord did so. And there came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses throughout all the land of Egypt. The land was ruined by the swarms of flies. Swarms and swarms of flies. I don't know about you, but when one fly gets into our house, it's like all hands on deck. Where's the fly? We need to get rid of the fly. Can you imagine the swarms and swarms of flies everywhere except the land of Goshen, which was a land where the Hebrew people dwelled within Egypt. God had drawn a division line, laying forth that the plague is here and not there. There is a distinction Pharaoh's desperation soon calls Moses and Aaron back and tries to make a deal with them here with the, the plague of the flies taking place. He tries to make a deal saying, listen, you can go and sacrifice to the Lord, but do it within the land of Egypt. Moses quickly replies and says, that would be an abomination to all of you Egyptians because you don't honor our God. You don't know our God. They, the people of Egypt would, would try to kill us if we did that within the land. No, we have to go as the Lord has commanded us. Pharaoh agrees just saying, don't go too far. Just get rid of the flies. Moses tells him that he will plead with the Lord for the flies to depart the following day. But warns Pharaoh... Not to cheat or break his word. But after the flies are removed, again we see the cycle continue. The heart of Pharaoh is hard. He is unwilling to let the people go. He is unwilling to listen and to obey the word of the Lord. The fifth plague comes in chapter 9. Read with me verse 1 through 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will fall very with a very severe plague upon your livestock that are in the field, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds and the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. Here in this fifth plague, we see while the previous plagues may have been an annoyance, something that was, what was problematic, something that caused a challenge for life, now the plague is becoming devastating. For in one day, all the livestock of Egypt died. And here again, God clearly draws the distinction. The livestock of the Egyptians dies, but not one of the livestock of the Hebrews would die. Again, the stench would have been overwhelming. But also again, Pharaoh's heart was hard. In every one of the plagues, we see that repeated statement. The hardness of Pharaoh's heart kept him from releasing 
the children of Israel. The sixth plague comes, and like the first, the third, and we'll see the ninth plague, there's not much written about the sixth plague, but we see this in chapter 9, verses 8 and 9. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from the kiln, and let Moses throw them into the air in sight of Pharaoh, and it shall become a fine dust over the land of Egypt, and become boils, breaking out in sores on man and beast throughout the land of of Egypt. This plague, like the third and the ninth, doesn't get much press. There's not much written about this plague. But what we do see clearly is that, again, the magicians are brought to the forefront. The magicians are highlighted saying, not only could they not repeat these plagues, could they not accomplish these plagues, but what we realize is that now even the plagues are affecting them so much so that they cannot even stand to oppose Moses because they're so covered in these great open sores. This is the first plague directly affecting the people of Egypt. And again, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. The seventh plague records the plague of the hail, the storm that came like no other storm. Look at chapter 9, verses 13 through 18. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh. Say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you yourself. And on your servants and on your people, so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose I have raised you up. To show you my power, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. You are still exalting yourself against my people and... Will not let them go. Behold, at about this time tomorrow, I will, cur- I will cause a very heavy hail to fall, such as never been in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. This plague of hail is a statement of God's power and authority. The hailstorm came. And destroyed everything that was left exposed in the open. People. Animals. Plants. Again, a distinction was made in the area where the Hebrews live versus where the Egyptians lived. Pharaoh called Moses in desperation in the midst of the hailstorm, which makes you wonder how Moses made it from one place to another. But we know that he is... The deliverer sent from God, and so God's protection followed. Pharaoh finally comes seemingly to his senses and saying to Moses, I have sinned. God is right, and I am wrong. This is what we realize through this plague. It brought Pharaoh to a point seemingly of repentance. Moses promises to call for an end of the hail once he leaves the city. But states that he knows, Moses tells Pharaoh, I know that you do not fear the Lord yet. Next comes the eighth plague. The eighth plague is a plague of locusts. Chapter 10, verses 1 through 6, we read this. The Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh... For I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts on your country. And they shall cover the face of the land so that no one can see the land. 
and they shall eat what is left to you after the hail, and they shall eat every tree that grows in the field, and they shall fill your houses and your ha- and the houses of your servants and of all the Egyptians, as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day they came on earth to this day. Then he turned and went out from Pharaoh. The plague of locusts is essentially promising to finish off what the hail left. We get a description under the hailstorm that says these plants were destroyed, but these survived. And now the locusts come in saying we're going to eat everything that survived. Egypt is being left with nothing. At this point, even Pharaoh's servants are pleading with him to stop. Even Pharaoh's servants are saying, how long are you going to let Moses do this to you? Just let him go. So Pharaoh, before the plague strikes, calls Moses in. Moses and Aaron says, listen, how many people are you going to take with you to this worship thing? Moses says, all of us. Like, No, you can't take everybody. Moses says, no, we, we all must go. That is what the Lord requires. So Pharaoh quickly dismisses and forces Moses and Aaron out. And then the plague strikes eating everything in sight. In panic, Pharaoh calls Moses and Aaron back again, again declaring his sin, asking them to remove this death from him. But again, after the locusts are gone, Moses' heart, oh, Pharaoh's heart is still hardened against God and God's people. The ninth plague comes in verses chapter 10, verse 21 through 23. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was pitch darkness in the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days, but all the people of Israel had light where they lived. This one, again, gets less coverage. It's the third of the cycle of three. And while there was a darkness that you could feel in Egypt, the place where the Hebrews lived had light. Pharaoh, after three days, calls Moses, telling him that they can go, just leave the flocks and herds. And again, Moses says, no, we can't do that. Because we cannot go worship the Lord without taking offerings and sacrifices to present before him. Pharaoh's heart is still hard and he banishes Moses. And as Moses leaves, he says, this is the last day that you will see my face. The nine plagues, they're organized and structured probably more uh, more formally than you might expect on reading them. Essentially, you have three rounds of three in the structure of the plagues. You have a leading plague, a a kind of middle plague, and then one that just kind of gets a brief notice, and then it starts again. Plagues number one, number four, and number seven, water to blood, the flies, and the hail, come with instruction for Moses to go before Pharaoh in the morning, lay out the demand to let God's people go, giving full warning of what is going to come if he does not. Plagues 2, 5, and 8, the frogs, the death of the livestock, and the locusts come with a warning to Pharaoh. In plagues 3, 6, and 9, gnats, boils, and darkness just seem to come without warning. As the plagues progress, both the severity and intensity increases. They go from being annoying inconveniences to devastating peril. In response to each one, there is a note about the hardness of Pharaoh's heart. As we looked at last week, some say that Pharaoh hardened his heart. Others, it'll say his heart was hardened. Others will say God hardened his heart. But in every case, the heart of Pharaoh was hard. And while his heart was hardened to the Hebrew people, Pharaoh's desperation is seen to increase. Pharaoh's desperation goes from merely being frustrated and annoyed to being 
panicked as he sees his entire empire, his entire kingdom decimated. One blow after another. He offers false repentance, tries to negotiate deals, pleads with Moses to offer reprieve. But what we realize and what we come to understand is that true repentance requires turning around and doing something different. And while Pharaoh over and over again says, listen, I'll let you go. I'll let you go. Please just stop the pain, stop the plague, stop the hurting. He never actually changes. You see, in all of this, God is showing the world his wonders. Egypt is the great superpower on earth at this time. And God is showing his superior power over the greatest superpower on earth. No one is going to release God's people, the Lord, with a mighty outstretched arm is going to bring them out. That's what we see in these plagues. Three main points that I want us to see from the plagues today. The first one, God judges sin. God judges sin. Six of the nine plagues are seen as having Pharaoh called by God through Moses and Aaron to let the people go. And often we see that Pharaoh, specifically in the text, refused to obey the command of the Lord. We see this repeated over and over throughout the plagues. Each time Pharaoh refused and sinned against God. And each time God brought judgment upon Pharaoh's sin. God being our perfect and holy creator must punish all sin. He cannot allow sin to go unpunished. You realize that God doesn't owe us chances. He doesn't owe us warnings. But in his grace, he's given them to us. God has displayed his existence and his power in all that he has made. Romans 1 details the fact that no one has an excuse before God because God has made his presence known. He's also written his law on our hearts. So that every person who's ever been born knows that God exists and knows that they're accountable to him. And this is why we see everywhere around the world, people are worshiping something. You don't ever encounter a society or a culture or a village or a tribe that doesn't have some sort of deity whom they are trying to appease. Why? Because God wrote it on their hearts that he exists and that they're accountable to him. You and I are accountable to our maker. But more than these general witnesses, God has given us his word. To Pharaoh, his word came through the words of Moses and Aaron. God has given us his word, which warns us of the dangers of sin and disobedience to God. You know, God never gives empty warnings. Anybody ever been to Wall, South Dakota? Heard of Wall Drug, South Dakota? Yeah, it's it, Quite honestly, it is the biggest tourist trap in North America. Because they put up signs everywhere. Wall is about the size of a postage stamp along the interstate going across South Dakota. Wall, South Dakota, is this small little place. And in 1931, someone took out a loan to start a drugstore. They had a five-year plan to make it solvent. And about one year before all of their loans would come due, in, in 1936, they said, we need to do something different. So they started putting up signs. And these signs now are all over the world. If you're driving across the Midwest, you will soon pass a sign that says, so many miles to Wall Drug, South Dakota. In fact, in World War II, as far away as France and Shanghai, soldiers from South Dakota put up signs, one of them in Shanghai reading 9,066 miles to Wall Drug, this way. you drive across the midwest you see sign after sign after sign it makes the little yeehaw junction up here on the turnpike look like child's play can you imagine all those signs and you pull into wall south dakota and there's no drugstore 
Can you imagine all that publicity, all those signs saying, hey, here it comes, here it comes. And if you drive past, you, you missed it. Can you imagine all those signs and there not being a store there? In baseball, it's illegal for a pitcher to start his windup and then stop. It's called a balk. And the penalty is the advancement of whoever's on base. If you're on first, you get to move to second. Second to third. Third, you get to advance home. A free run. A balk is illegal in baseball. God never gives empty warnings. For him to give a warning and not to follow through would be for him to lie and violate his character. God must keep his word, which means he must punish all sin. The writer of Hebrews states for us, it is appointed for man to die once and after that face the judgment. Romans, Paul writes to us and says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And just a little bit later, he declares, for the wages of sin is death. These plagues demonstrate many things. But one of the foremost things that we recognize in these plagues is that God judges sin. God judges sin. And this is a problem for you and I. Because we are made by God. We are created in His image. And yet every one of us has sinned against Him. Every one of us has broken His law. It's his world. It's his rule. He is the king, like it or not. And every one of us stands guilty. Because none of us have lived a perfect life. You see, the story of all humanity except for Jesus is that every person who's ever lived is guilty of sin before their creator. And God must judge all sin. And that leaves you and I guilty, deserving judgment, because all of us have sinned before God. The second thing I want us to see is that God works all things for his glory. God works all things for his glory. Pharaoh's sin and continual hardness of heart was wrong and evil of him. The enslavement of the people of Israel was ruthless. Pharaoh's repeated broken promises of release were, was a cruel communication, dishonest and motivated by selfish pride and self-preservation. God's judgment through the plagues was severe upon the people of Egypt. And God is working all these things for his glory. We read in Exodus chapter 9, verse 14 through 16. God speaking through Moses, For this time I will send all my plagues on you yourself and on your servants and your people so that you will know that there is none like me in all the earth. Verse 16. But for this purpose I have raised you up, speaking of Pharaoh, to show my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. God is passionate about the fame of his own name. God is passionate about his own glory. Now, if we think about that, for you or I to make that statement makes all of us a little bit uncomfortable. I'm passionate about my glory. And all of you should rightly get up and leave. Because I'm not worthy of that glory. No human is because none of us are that good. None of us are that great. We're not the greatest. We're not the best. We're not those that are worthy of that type of adoration and praise. But here's the thing. It is right for God to be passionate about his glory. Because he is the only one who is worthy rightly of it. God is glorious. He is majestic. He is the highest and greatest and best of beings. He is the one who rightly deserves glory, who rightly deserves praise. His glory is good for us. Our glory is not good for us. For us to, tr to try 
to force our glory leaves us empty and depressed. But to behold the glory of God is where you find your greatest delight. Because you were made, hear this, you were made to find joy in feeling small in the presence of true glory and greatness. I'll give you a comparison. I've, I've got a little dip in my front yard. It's, just, it's, it's like this little hole. When I go through it with the mower, it just kind of goes, you know. It's, it's just a little small thing. But, you know, nobody lines up in my yard to come look at it. You find that strange? Nobody, find, nobody lines up. Nobody's paying me money to come stand and look at the little dip in my front yard. But yet there are millions of people right now trying to go see the Grand Canyon. It's just a little dip in the earth, right? Just a little hole just sunk down. Canyon. Why do they go and pay money and spend time to go see the Grand Canyon and they don't come and look at the little dip in my front yard? It's the same principle, right? Because when you stand next to the little dip in my front yard, if you don't know it's there, you probably don't recognize it. But you go stand next to the rim of the Grand Canyon and you feel about this big. And you're struck with awe and wonder and joy. Because you were made to find joy, not in feeling big and superior like you would be to the little dip in my front yard. But to feel small in the presence of true greatness and glory. God made you to find your greatest joy in beholding his glory. That's the way you were designed. And God is orchestrating all things for his glory. The 72 dolphins essentially created the dolphins fan base. The team had existed a little bit longer than this, but but they're only three years into the NFL when they won the perfect season with the Super Bowl on top. The only team ever to win a perfect season with the Super Bowl is the 72 Miami Dolphins. And that essentially created the Miami Dolphins fan base, all the fervor and celebration around that. During that season, the fans are cheering. They're rejoicing. They're they're celebrating these victories. They're, They're cheering on the Dolphins. But do you see, the Dolphins get glory from that positive cheering, but they also got glory from the fact that they defeated their foes. They also affirmed and confirmed their glory, their power, their their strength in consistent victory after victory after victory, all the way up to beating the Redskins in the Super Bowl that year. You see, both sides point to the glory of the 72 Dolphins. Likewise, both the faith of the people of Israel... And God's protection and preservation of them. As well as the plagues upon the people of Egypt. Are both orchestrated for the sake of pointing to the glory of the one true and living God. God is a glorious God. In fact, Isaiah 48, he says, I will not give my glory to another. The story of this world is not about you. You and I can't bear that weight. The story of this world is about God. He is the hero. He is the rescuer. He is the champion of this grand story. It is his might that rescues his people so that his name will be known among the nations. In our peril, sitting under right judgment... God sent his son. In love, he sent Jesus to live the life that you and I could not live. And die the death that you and I deserve. And rise again triumphantly, not because his disciples snuck in and resuscitated him. But by his own power and for his own glory. God is the glorious rescuer of his people. And he comes to you declaring that he will be glorified. 
God is glorified in sending Jesus to suffer and die for the sins of the world, that he might be the rescuer, the sacrifice for his people. God is glorified through saving sinners like you and like me, through Jesus' death and resurrection, not through our own works, because none of us have anything for which we can boast. God is glorified in the righteous judgment of sinners for their sins. You see, God will be glorified in your life. The question is how? God will be glorified either through completely decimating you in judgment for your sins. Or he will be glorified through your humble repentance being your rescuer your Savior, your Lord. And the difference there is based upon whether or not you turn and trust in Him. Whether or not you repent of trying to save yourself and trust wholly in what Jesus has done for you. God is glorified in working all things for His perfect plan. He will get glory through your life. If you have never trusted him. Turn. And trust that he will be glorified. In your. Forgiveness. And saving rescue. The third thing I want us to see. Is that there is no one like the Lord. There is no one like the Lord. It's amazing to see how direct God is in displaying and declaring his uniqueness through the plagues. There is no one like him. In fact, the plagues appear to be an all-out assault on the gods of Egypt. Chapter 12 of Exodus, verse 12, says this, For I will pass over the land of Egypt That night, and I will strike all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute my judgments. I am the Lord. Chapter 15, verse 11. This is after they cross the Red Sea, the song of Moses. Moses declares this Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? As Moses reports all that happened to his father-in-law Jethro as they make their way to the mount of God. In chapter 18, verse 11, Jethro responds and says, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people. And then in Numbers A little bit later on in the story, Numbers chapter 33. We see again this declaration pointing back to God's deliverance of his people through the plagues. Numbers chapter 33 verses 3 and 4. They set out from Ramses in the first month on the 15th day of the month. On the day after the Passover, the people went out triumphantly in the sight of all the Egyptians while the Egyptians were burying their firstborn whom the Lord had struck down among them on their gods also the Lord executed judgments in Egypt at the time of the exodus there are no less than 80 major deities 80 gods which they worshipped Many smaller gods, local gods to different communities, but 80 major deities at the time of the Exodus. And because the the biblical text does not detail this plague is assaulting this false god, we, we can't make firm assumptions about exactly how this lays out. You see in the text that the plagues were an assault against the gods of Egypt, showing them powerless, showing them to be weak and untrustworthy, incapable of doing anything. But it's easy to see how certain ones of the gods were indicted by the plagues. For instance, the Nile turning to blood. Apis, the god of the Nile. 
Isis, the goddess of the Nile, as well as Kanum, the guardian of the Nile, were all shown to be powerless. Heket, the goddess of birth, pictured with the head of a frog on a human body, is shown to be impotent through the plague of frogs. Likewise, Hathor, represented with a cat with the head of a cow, could not stop the death of all the livestock of Egypt. Sekhem, the god, the goddess of power with power over disease, could not even heal the magicians who were so afflicted with boils that they could not stand before Moses. The god of desert storms, Set, was obliterated by the hail. Osiris, the god of crops, was eaten alive by the locust. Likewise, Ray and Horus, both sun gods, as well as Newt and Hathor, both sky gods, were lost in the blinding darkness of the ninth plague. God is God. And there is no one like God. All the gods of the nations can never satisfy. They can never rescue. They can never answer your need. You say, well, Pastor Mark, it's easy to see that carved statues of stone or wood, they they can't really do anything. They're just figurines. They, They don't have any power. Do you realize that millions of people today Worship similarly fashioned idols. Millions of people across this world today go before gods of wood, stone, or metal, formed and shaped as objects of worship, painted in bright, vibrant colors. They worship and offer sacrifice. They pray asking for favor to these figurines. But yet here in our culture, the gods are a little less obvious. They might not be statues painted in bright colors. But they are just as real. Because the gods of our culture are just as worshipped. Gods of our culture like wealth and fame. Our culture worships the gods of pleasure and absolute autonomy. We as a a culture worship sports and other movements which ironically get named cult followings. But no matter how much wealth you amass or how much fame you gain for yourself, in the end, neither can save you. You can't buy forgiveness. Nor can you win a popularity contest to somehow gain merit before God. While the gods of pleasure and promise of pleasure promise the heights of joy and lasting bliss, they leave you empty and wounded and depressed. Absolute personal autonomy, which is at the height of so much of our cultural conflict today, is ultimately the worship of self. In the claim to be able to identify oneself however it is desired, it places the entire weight of satisfying your joy on yourself, a weight which you were never intended to be able to carry. The worship of sports and other cultural movements may be exciting at the start but in the end leaves you empty. How many serious fans are more often upset at their team than happily celebrating it? Whether the God is a form statue or a more modern adaptation, the issues are the same. No other God can satisfy your soul. No other God can deliver you and meet your desperate needs. The Lord alone is God. And this is why over and over again throughout the plagues, he declares this reality. He's emphasizing who he is in the face of these other gods. Chapter 7, verse 17, God declares, Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn to blood. Chapter 8, verse 10. And he said, tomorrow, Moses said, 
be it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. Chapter 22 of, of, of verse 22 of chapter 8. But on this day, I will set apart the land of, Ocean, of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Chapter 9, verse 14. For this time I will send all my plagues on you yourself and on your servants and your people so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Chapter 9, verse 29. Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will stretch out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease and there will be no more hail so that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. Chapter 10, verse 2. And that you... And that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. God wants us to know that he alone is God. God is God and there is no other. So here's the question. Who are you trusting today? To whom do you look to be satisfied, to find happiness? To whom are you looking for rescue? If you were looking anywhere other than Jesus, you will never find what your soul most deeply desires. Worship God, for He alone is At this point, unless we go down to Sonny's for a steak ogie, we don't even bother to order it. Because we found one that has no match. Your God has no match. There is none who can compare to him. Do not look for something that might be better. Because there is none to be found. The Lord alone is God. From the story of the plagues, we see clearly that God judges sin. He gives no empty warnings. If you have never trusted in Jesus today, run to Him. Hear the warning of the plagues today. Do not harden yourself against the God who has come to bring your forgiveness and your rescue. Your sins can be forgiven. Because they've been punished in the cross of Jesus Christ. If they are not punished there. Then you will bear them for yourself. And no one can sustain that weight. Turn and trust Jesus today. Find forgiveness. Find the salvation your soul desires. Rejoice for God is working all things for his glory. And that is good for you and for me. No one is like the Lord. Let us together worship Him alone. Father, thank You for the privilege of this day. Thank You that You are the one true and living God and there is none who can challenge You for Your place and Your station. Lord, I pray that every person here today would know and see Your glory. And that in there, we would find the highest of our soul's delights. Holy Spirit, come now. Convict us of sin. Encourage our hearts where we need encouragement. Make us to look more like Jesus as we worship you alone today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.